And now, let's start. Our first session will focus on uh, big challenges uh, facing uh, all TV stations, especially public TV stations, public services. Here in Europe, we discuss a lot about our fears, about challenges, about new generations focusing on something else and not on TV screens. And uh, uh, no matter how difficult the conditions are for us in Europe, it can be even harder on the other side of Atlantic. So in the uh, first session, we'll discuss how they do that in Canada. I invite now Mr. José Lopuch de Araujo. He is a, a member of RTP delegation here, our host. He will introduce his guest, very interesting man. I'm sure that after his presentations, you will have many questions for them. Mr. José. Hello, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, really pleased to, to start this first session because, in fact, as I think uh, most of you know, I was born here in the Highlands, so I'm really, really pleased to start the first session of our uh, 35th edition conference of uh, CIRCOM. So this morning, we are going to have as keynote speaker for the first session, uh, really a very special guest. Uh, I have met Hubert Lacroix uh, some years ago, and uh, when I, I listened for the first time uh, Hubert speaking about public service, I was quite impressed. He, he, he was really, for me, when I was listening to him, really a public service fighter. Uh, he was uh, so so passionate for the, 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 the public service, uh, so involved, and, uh, and, and, and it, they put so strong, um, uh, involve, so involved in, in the, the, the fighting that in that time he was uh, having in Canada. Because in that time, Canada uh, government was cutting the budget. And um, Hubert Lacroix, that uh, is in now in second mandate as president of Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, CBC, is, as you know, a very, very important television in the world and one of the biggest public service in the world, too. So uh, in these 10 years, last 10 years, Uber has made uh, really a revolution in CBC. He has put the digital on the agenda of CBC. He's going to talk about that. And really, digital has been proved as a fantastic possibility to us, public service, to be connected directly with the citizens, which is really our goal as public service, and especially as public service regional television, because we are closer to the public. So um, my friend Hubert Lacroix has a great experience to share with us. Uh, as I told you, he, he has been for the last 10 years president, CEO of CBC, and I'm very honored that he has accepted uh, my invitation to be the keynote speaker of our Circum Regional. As you know, we have the secretary has told uh, we have, uh, and our president of RTP, we have a very important diaspora of Azorian people living in Canada. Nowadays, we have in the Azores around 280,000 people, 80, people, 280, people living in the islands, and we have in Canada, with the first generation, around a half million in Canada. So we are very connected with Canada, too. So please welcome Monsieur Hubert Lacroix, my very good friend, president of CBC. Hello, everybody. 
As I walked out on the stage, the clicker died. Um, thank you, thank you, Jose, for your kind words. Thank you, Sircom, for having invited me. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Fernando. Uh, special thanks also to everybody that have put up this conference because we just hosted PBI in Montreal last year, and I know how much work this is, how much work it is for the ladies in front, for the organization, for the buses, for the dinners that we, that we uh, attended last night. It has been uh, a few days here, and uh, grâce à votre hospitalité, José, it has been extraordinary. Thank you, Rui, particularly. And the techies who are upstairs and over here, and particularly Guillaume, uh, thank you for putting this presentation on the screen because we had some challenges and because of their magic. I'm going to be able to use it. So I've been in my job now for close to 10 years. The changes over that media environment have been obviously disruptive. You know that. Every day, if your meetings are like ours, and the conversations in the back room are the conversations that we are having, you guys are talking about the Netflix penetration rates. You're talking about their investment in content, $6 billion US in 2017 and growing. You're hearing, and you know, that Facebook now is close to 2 billion monthly active users and that they are, in June, entering TV-like shows. You also know that 300 million monthly users of Snapchat take 2.5 billion snaps per day. You also know that Twitter is entering the sports world and will be broadcasting in North America football games. And as a public broadcaster, probably built like us on legacy assets like radio and television, you're looking at all of this and you're saying, what's going to happen to us? And you're probably having these conversations at the same time that you're dealing with substantial reductions from your, on financial support from your respective governments, or you're having conversations with these governments on your conditions of license, your mandate, or your terms of reference, and you're trying to reinvent your failing business model. That's my world too. I know about that. And sorry, I don't have all the answers. However, my intention today is to tell you what we're doing at CBC Radio Canada and the work that we have done, how digital is helping us transform Canada's public broadcaster. It's an 80-year-old broadcaster. How some of the choices we have made have impacted our culture and our employees. How local services are one of the three key pillars in our strategy 2020, our 2020 plan. And how the 18 to 34-year-old crowd are woven into all of these choices, and much less this year, an attention of our focus as an age group. And my thinking on that has changed, and you'll hear about that a bit later. So my story today starts with financial pressures. In 2012, we were faced with a second round of budget cuts. The government was taking away $115 million Canadian out of our budgets combined with direct and other indirect cuts that we were facing, budgets, uh, federally um, driven cuts or regulated cuts, we were looking at about a $200 million hit, which was about 20% of the government subsidy. We are financed 60% through government, about a billion dollars, and about 450 million bucks, $500 million through our commercial activities or ad revenues, amongst others. And I had just announced, and we had managed the elimination at that time of about 900 full-time positions, about 10% of our staff in 2009. Because we had that time, like many of you in the room, we, were, we had faced the consequences of the meltdown in 2008, 2009 of the ad revenues on our business models. So that was my, three, my third round of cuts. So we were looking for ways to reduce costs again. And one of the many decisions that we took was to reshape our regional offerings by going to 90-minute TV newscasts at supper time 
in every regional market. The concept was three times 30 minutes, and the news of the first 30 minutes would flow and will roll into the next, th in the next two 30-minute blocks, evolving, uh, and obviously in a carousel format. It was between 5 and 6.30 in the evening. We would thus save on late afternoon programming, and we would honor our commitment to the regions because we were doing more local news. So the objective was clearly financial. We were reducing costs, but the mission and the vision was pure public broadcasting. So we realized that the decision to do it that way was a mistake. We realized that that decision led us to discover how, even in our own regional markets, how diverse the consumption habits of Canadians were. A one-size-fits-all was not a good idea. I'll give you an example. In Calgary, Alberta, our third largest city, our morning news program on radio was number one in the market, way ahead of everybody else. But nobody watched the 6 p.m. television news. Television had no interest. So when we poured in more time and more minutes and more money, that didn't do anything for the people in Calgary. Yet in Winnipeg, in Manitoba, the province beside it, our supper time news was extremely popular on TV and needed to be invested in and supported. So it didn't make sense to have one single format across the country. So we looked at our audience numbers and we decided that we were going to go 30 minutes across to give a base to everybody and then 60 minutes but only in the markets that actually had audiences above a certain level. So we killed the 90-minute format. That meant less TV in most markets, but not less coverage, because that is when we made this commitment. As an alternative, we promised to provide more local coverage from morning until night, what we called from bonjour to bonsoir, from good morning to good evening, so that we would use our other platforms web, mobile, and radio. That was the start of our digital shift. So, in April 2014, we launched our strategic plan, the 2020 plan, to become three things, more local, more digital, to offer more Canadian content, more Canadian ambitious programming, and to do it all in a way that was more financially sustainable. And we clearly also announced that we were inverting our priorities. We were going from television, radio, web, mobile, to mobile, web, radio, television. And for a public broadcaster known for 80 years for its legacy assets, and it's radio and television, that was transformational. And I can assure you, I was not a very popular person. The plan's vision was to make CBC Radio Canada the public space at the heart of the conversations with Canadians, at the heart of conversations, the heart of experiences. It was all about taking us closer to the citizens that we serve in all the markets. But the plan, also needed to develop long-term sustainable ways for us to manage our finances. And I told everybody again in 2014 that we were going to take another 1,500 job loss in order to change our skills. Again, not a very popular announcement. I also told our employees that the most painful and frustrating task for me had been to implement one round of cuts after the other just to respond to a changing environment and to balance our budgets. I had enough of these announcements, so the 2020 plan had to become sustainable by itself for the foreseeable future. So, we're three years down. Where are we now? Well, 
the number of visits on our digital platforms has gone from 9 million visits per month to 16.3 million per month. Aggressively on our way to passing our objective of 18 million by 2020. Now that we are working and getting reach, the objective will be to better our engagement. Our regional websites went from, when we started this, 8 to 12 refreshes per day, to 8 to 12 refreshes per hour, to now becoming continuous news. And to illustrate this shift that we made, I'd like to take the, I'd like to take the next minutes to actually show you how we use these multiple platforms, how we now consider this as one offering, relevant to our young audiences included. So we're a big country. This is us. We work across six time zones, two official languages, French and English, eight indigenous languages. We have 27 regional TV, TV stations. We have 87 regular radio stations. And our last two stations are completely digital. No radio stick, no TV antenna, because there were no frequency available. Completely digital stations. So let's travel across our country. We'll start in the north. It's beautiful, it's harsh. Communities are far apart, and CBC North is the key for people to get their information and their news. We have decades of programs, mostly radio broadcasts, on different formats, CDs, cassettes, reel-to-reel. -reel. The importance of this collection cannot be overstated. So we collected 64,000 hours worth of these indigenous conversations, we set up a storage server. We built workstations with, digi with digitization gear in Yellowknife, in the famous station. We're now in the process of digitizing the content. We're working with experts to keep these catalogs and these stories. We're working with the communities and their leaders to be represented in these collections and to find the best way to actually give them back the content and preserve it. And this initiative is part of a mass digitization project, a five to eight year project, which was actually announced last week on May 11. It's costly. It's about five to eight million dollars a year. It's modular so that if we start something and we don't have the budgets to finish the whole of the program, we'll be able to work in modules. And it's all about showcasing our heritage for the generations to come because we feel that we cannot be a public broadcaster based on digital unless you can actually access all of these archives and you make them available and you can share them, not only with the citizens that we serve, but at one point in time with the other partners that could actually use that content. Got a long way to go, but this is an idea, not an idea, but this is it's part of the strategy to actually build the base on which we work. Then, we go to BC. It's three o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon. It's fall. Most of us are at work. The kids are at school, waiting impatiently for the end of the day. When two tectonic plates that have been locked together for 300 years suddenly slip past one another. The epicenter is 200 kilometers off the west coast of southern Washington state and 30 kilometers under the ocean floor. Rocks give way releasing centuries of built-up stress. The Earth unzips. So on the West Coast, you find Vancouver. As you heard on this podcast, Vancouver is built on a fault line. It's actually British Columbia's most important city. It's beautiful, but it is on a fault line. And we started exploring how we could actually use this in our mandate of a public broadcaster and actually raise the awareness. We found that this way, through a podcast, drew thousands of listeners, actually hundreds of thousands of listeners, 
was the number one podcast downloaded on iTunes the first week. It contributed to the provincial government taking action on an earthquake early warning program. So our series had impact, the kind of impact that we as public broadcasters in this room know we have when our, when our content is compelling and discovered. This initiative was about radio and reaching out to listeners in a way that could be seen as the natural extension of our radio audience in podcasting. Also a method that we know our younger generation actually enjoys to carry and listen to. Another initiative. This is what we did. This is Vancouver. First week. And we're going to go to what happened in Fort McMurray. Rocky Mountains, Alberta, it's an oil town, Fort McMurray. Last May, over 80,000 people had to leave behind everything they had and evacuate a city under fire. It was two months before we actually controlled the fires around Fort McMurray. I want you to take a look at this. And that's when we saw all the vehicles inching their way along so slowly, and on the other side of them was this wall of flames. We all just escalated so quickly. I can remember that we, we had to keep moving because you know, we'd find a position where we thought we were safe, and all of a sudden the fire was getting closer. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And we'd set up and there, there was the fire behind us and we wanted to make sure we you know, showed people what was actually going on. And, and there was a fire behind us, but by the time we finished that hit, there were two others that were much closer to us. It was terrifying. By the end of the hit, I, I didn't even know if I'd be able to finish it because the smoke was just, it, it was just suffocating. We decided, well, we'll go to the evacuation center, which is right downtown, and talk to some people who have been told to evacuate to this place. This is the list of neighborhoods that are under a mandatory evacuation order. So that is Gregoire, Beacon Hill. Then that evacuation center was, was evacuated itself. What do you make of the safety of this location right now? Until we get the order to evacuate, um, we feel safe here. The instruction at that time from officials was that anyone north of Confederation had to go north. We only had so much fuel in our car, so that's when we realized if this fire continues to progress from the south to the north, we're hooped. 25,000 people were in a similar situation to what we were in. People were, were confused as to what to do. I mean, there was so much smoke and so much fire. People were trying to fill up their cars with gas. There was no fuel. Uh, some people were walking down the road with luggage. It was very chaotic. Nobody knows what to do, so we're gonna just head south as much as we can. Follow everybody else, I guess. Oh my God, Sarah, this is gonna work out. <laughs> oh, you can feel the heat. Holy shit. Now, when you see these images and you see the house on fire or the street burned out, and I'm not sure that there's, that there's been a way to properly illustrate just how big of a disaster this is. So during that crisis, traffic on the Radio-Canada Alberta website and on cbc.edmonton got over 20 million visits. Then you compare that to 15,000 or 20,000 viewers that we normally get on our TV suppertime news. When I visited this group, our Edmonton uh, station, 10 days after the, uh, the fires, Nobody in that station ever doubted again the importance of being digital, of having been able to speak through radio and the platforms, their phones, 
the people who were in the middle of that crisis, union leaders included. Twelve staff remained on the ground the day after the evacuation order and were the first to go back there. We actually were, as a public broadcaster, and as many in this, in this room know, you do that well also. And the reporter you saw, I've got a cute story here. In the video, his name is Briar Stewart. One of the Fort, Fort McMurray couple that was stuck on this auto route for hours and hours. The woman was actually pregnant and gave birth during that week. And guess what the name of the new baby was? Briar. Because through those terrible days, the mother thought that Briar Stewart had made a connection with her in providing all of this information to her for the 10 days that happened. So what we learned, obviously the power of social media, the power of reach, our digital platforms, the combination of audio and video, all in one as a public broadcaster in that environment. So let's go east on our map. You may have heard about the terrible attack on a mosque in Quebec City on January 29th. A government came in, killed six men, wounded several others, and our Alexandre Duval from Radio-Canada in Quebec City was the first one on site to report on this tragedy on TV and social media. Here's a clip. On vous présente cette édition spéciale du Téléjournal Québec. On a retrouvé le Québec. Un Québec solidaire. Il y a déjà des centaines de personnes qui sont arrivées ici, sûrement tout près de vous, Bruno. Nous allons vous présenter au cours des prochaines minutes la cérémonie religieuse. On se trouve tout de suite à l'entrée des dignitaires, Bruno, et on surveille impatiemment. C'est l'arrivée du premier ministre Justin Trudeau. Nous souhaitons que ce bel élan d'empathie et de solidarité dure, mais on doit travailler ensemble pour ça. We were able to deliver this coverage because we decided to prioritize local and digital. And by the way, the position of that reporter that night, who was in the station from Bonjour to Bonsoir, was funded because the, re the government that was elected in 2015 reinvested some money in the public broadcaster. And we would not normally have had a journalist covering that pure night. The network would have kicked in. But you know when you're in Montreal and the event is happening in Quebec City that there is no way that you can be in that community locally uh, present and immediately on the scene if you're two and a half hours away. Our traffic on Radio-Canada CBC increased by 181%. Again, a focus on digital first. A couple of other weather-related stories. At about the same time in New Brunswick on the East Coast, at the same time that this unfortunate situation happened, this tragic event in Quebec City, New Brunswick was hit. New Brunswick is on the East Coast and was hit by a severe ice storm. It knocked down power lines, made driving impossible, and it took 12 days to actually restore power in the province. 12 days of freezing temperature, no power, and at, actually at one point in time our staff was carrying canisters of gasoline to keep our, ra our radio transmitters up. Here's a quick peek. Still, our team in Edmonton managed to provide coverage. 51 hours of special programming on radio, 12 hours of regional TV, where the regional station actually cut off from the national network and provided regional coverage 12 hours straight. Unheard of. 128 updates on our national TV networks to support the regional station doing the work. And obviously, again, the website saw incredible numbers, 24% increase, I can throw numbers like this. But you get the point of the platforms all supporting each other in this event driven by radio. Message for us was you can't simply forget 
the legacy assets in this transformation as you are pushing forward your digital focus. So, digital citizens. You realize, everybody in this room realizes, the service to communities is not unique to us. You do it every day, regional broadcasting. And people want to know what's going on in their community. They have constant access to national, international news and information. Just look at what happened, unfortunately, in Manchester. Look at where you got your information on the Manchester stories. But local stories now become more and more difficult to find and more and more expensive to produce. And you need people on the ground. The example of Alexandre Duval in Quebec City. And as you know, private media is cutting back on anything that does not return dollars to their shareholders. And we all know that newsrooms do not return dollars to shareholders. So the last years has been especially difficult for newspapers and regional newsrooms in Canada. In fact, between 2008 and 2016, 169 Canadian news outlets closed or were merged into other outlets. And that's where the 2020 plan, the CBC Radio Canada 2020 plan, comes into play. An unwavering commitment to local coverage, an unwavering commitment to compelling content, an unwavering commitment to digital. Because citizens not only want the content that relates to them personally, they want content that speaks to them intelligently and, you know, on the platform of your choice and of their choice. And what we have realized, what I have realized, is that we have been wrong in targeting the 18 to 34-year-olds, per se. We've started changing our vocabulary, even when we talk about that generation. We now talk about Gen C, generation content, and about digital citizens. We talk much less about millennials. We are much more inclusive in our vocabulary. Our transformation has also changed the way we cover signature events. Look at what we did in Rio. It's just better sometimes to watch an event of that kind in a sports bar, large screen, fun, friends, beer, whatever you're drinking, family, other sports fans, People you don't know, you wave the flags, you have fun. But everybody in that bar will expect to get their updates on their mobile device, devices as they are watching the big screens. They have it in their pocket. So our Olympic coverage was an example of how our digital first approach supported the traditional platforms. During the 2016 Olympics, we reached 32.1 million Canadians. That's a lot of our country more viewers in Canada than for any other previous Olympic Games. We led with our digital coverage. We had a special app. We streamed just about every sports competition, whether Canadians were performing or not. And yes, the TV audiences were solid. CBC television only, average uh, daily audiences increased. You can see that on the screen. But the digital numbers were unheard of, through the roof. The websites and the apps generated more than 229 million visits, 37 million video views over the course of the games. When you have an event of this kind, and you put your platforms together, and you lead with digital, and everything then supports digital, and you convince your sports team that that's the way to do it, and that the television broadcast is no longer the event of the day, you're transforming slowly your employees into the digital future. I'll remind you that we're only 36 million people in Canada. We're 16.3 million into our plan. We hope to have 18 million visits by 2020. We will have doubled the number of people that come to our visits, to our sites, on, our, on, a, monthly, on a monthly basis. And we'll talk, if you want to, in the Q&A period about engagement. Because this is one thing reach. You can buy likes. You can't buy engagement.
And right now, our focus is all about the number of minutes, what they do, what they watch, how they connect. And as you know, data analytics and trying to figure out what they do once you have them on your, uh, in your reach or on your site is key right now to the next version of the 2020 plan. But it's resonating. It's about stories, right? I want to tell you about this story and why we're in digital. We are in digital because we want to be at the heart of the conversation and the experiences of Canadians. I told you that a few minutes ago. Here's a great example. In the northwest of Canada, there's a stretch of Highway 16 called the Highway of Tears. Close to 50 Indigenous women have gone missing while hitchhiking, hitchhiking on that stretch that you see. It's actually a very common way of getting from one point to another hitchhiking. But it's a local strategy and it's a national shame. So CBC decided to investigate. CBC decided that all Canadians needed to know what was happening out there in the region. An investigating team out of Winnipeg and three other stations started the research. They built an interactive website. 300 people were actually identified around those 50 missing women. And then our national affairs radio show, The Current, produced a VR doc about the Highway of Tears. Virtual reality here allowed us and allowed Canadians to be at the side of the highway to sit in the living room of a mother struggling to find what happened to her daughter. And we also took the, to technology, sorry, to communities across the country where we invited people to come in, to watch it, to listen to our radio program, which we put on the road, and to talk about it together. I actually took the virtual reality doc to a parliamentary committee to show MPs, members of parliament, MPs, what innovations their public broadcaster was actually doing in the context of news. You should have seen the MPs moving around with the big goggles on their heads. Because The Current is a trusted radio program and also because of the compelling story telling that virtual reality made it possible, people experience the story in a way that had not been told before. More than 1.8 million Canadians tuned in to the town halls that aired on CBC Radio 1, radio, and almost half a million people followed the story on Facebook. The podcast was downloaded a total of 37,000 times. And again, this is my point. What started out as a television interactive website through the investigating team in, Un in Winnipeg became the famous website, elevated the conversation somewhere else to a national level, morphed into a radio program that was supported by a virtual reality initiative. Take a look. It simply is her story. She is talking to you in this documentary about what happened when she lost her daughter, uh, the, the day that it happened, how she found out. My name is Matilda Wilson. I have six children all together, and Ramona is the youngest one. She was 16 years old when she was murdered. Okay, so. At the beginning of this clip, you would have seen the people in the room during the radio program as they were listening and being invited into the room of the radio with the goggles on their head. And the, the strength of putting that person into, or you, in that room, speaking or listening to the indigenous woman, speaking to you as if you were in her kitchen, is extraordinary. Again, supporting our, um, our news telling with the digital 
instruments to make it even more compelling. Did we lose our... No? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, three last examples before we take questions. So as public media services, obviously, we want to engage younger generations. So what's the story about CBC Radio-Canada? In those particular instances where our focus on the content is a bit different, we don't want to abandon the older generations. We all have the same challenge in this room. But we can't be relevant to all in the same way. Even when we're covering the same event, or we do the same regular program on our schedules. La soirée est encore jeune, obviously resonates with a younger generation. It's a live radio show in a bar restaurant setting in Montreal with a very, very strong social media presence on Facebook, which has now become a television program at the same time because we simply added two cameras. They podcast. We take the show on the road. There's an outreach public event at each one of those in each one of those situations, and through Facebook Live conversations, we extend the number of people that we speak to. We have found that the audience has grown from 16 years old up to people my age, listening to La Soirée Tant Jeune. Again, never about one platform at a time. This is something I really like. It's called RAD. It's a challenge that I sent to our news team because I was sick and tired of hearing about vice. Vice is not news. Vice is docs. Vice is not what we do in our newsrooms. However, it attracts a whole bunch of people. So I challenged our news team to find a way. And what we did is we put in a room, literally a lab, these kids. Nobody's over 30 years old. They're all CBC Radio Canada reporters. They are all submitted to the same standard of journalistic standards and practices that we have in the main newsroom. But their job is to tell stories differently and to tell stories about information, uh, about news, but also about current affairs in a way which speaks to the digital citizens. They were the ones that told me, La Croix, you're wrong. We don't want to target 18 to 34 years old. The grandmother who actually uses an iPad smartly is going to be part of the people we speak to. But it's going to be a different way of speaking. This is actually eight days old. The content that you're going to see, it's going to give you an idea of the kind of sound and feel of what they have produced something we announced. It took them about seven or eight months of trying to find their way. We literally gave them the keys, supported the budget, and said, go. And we did something we never do at CBC Radio Canada. We released control, because that's difficult to do. Sorry, it's only in French. It's literally new. We're going to build a wall. 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 A great wall. A great, great wall. Tout le monde parle du mur de Donald. Surtout Donald. Mais sur l'ensemble du globe, des murs entre deux pays, il y en a 70. Un sommet dans l'histoire moderne. Mais pourquoi il y a autant de murs? Même si Donald Trump prétend construire des murs mieux que personne d'autre, Nobody builds walls better than me, believe me. C'est pas lui qui a inventé le concept des murs entre deux pays. Le mur d'Adrien, la grande muraille de Chine. China? Voilà. Si on se concentre sur la période post-Deuxième Guerre mondiale, c'est durant la guerre froide que se sont d'abord répandus les murs. Plusieurs servaient de barrière entre les pays alliés des États-Unis et ceux alliés de l'Union soviétique. L'ouverture du mur marque ainsi la fin d'un autre symbole de la division de l'Europe. Avec la chute du mur de Berlin en 1989, la fin de la guerre froide et le début de la mondialisation, on a cru à la fin des murs, l'ouverture des frontières. Et effectivement, La construction de murs a brièvement ralenti dans les années 90. Mais au début des années 2000... Ça, ça a fait peur à beaucoup de monde. 
et les murs ont recommencé à pousser pour prévenir le terrorisme. Repousser la menace terroriste, c'est une des quatre raisons invoquées par des gouvernements qui construisent des murs, comme le gouvernement d'Israël, avec ses murs à la frontière de la bande de Gaza et de la Cisjordanie pour, officiellement, se protéger du terrorisme palestinien. Les autres raisons, freiner la contrebande. C'est d'ailleurs pour freiner la contrebande de cigarettes que la Lituanie a annoncé récemment la construction d'un mur à sa frontière avec Kaliningrad, un territoire russe. On sert aussi les murs pour maintenir la paix entre deux pays en conflit, comme entre la Corée du Nord et la Corée du Sud, comme entre la République de Chypre, dans le sud, et le nord de l'île, revendiquée par la Turquie. Et surtout, on construit des murs pour freiner l'immigration illégale, comme le mur de Trump. Freiner l'immigration illégale, c'est l'objectif d'une majorité des 70 murs qui existent et d'une majorité des quelques 20 murs qui ont été annoncés depuis 2011. 2011 comme 2001. C'est une année marquante dans la construction de murs. En 2011, c'était les soulèvements du printemps arabe. Le printemps arabe a servi de bougie d'allumage à la guerre civile en Syrie. La guerre en Syrie a contribué à la crise des migrants. Des dizaines de milliers d'autres réfugiés continuent d'affluer vers l'Europe. Et pour freiner les migrants, l'Europe a bâti tout plein de murs. La Hongrie érige en ce moment une deuxième barrière anti-migrants à sa frontière avec la Serbie. Le début aujourd'hui de la construction d'un mur pour empêcher les migrants d'accéder au port de Calais. Et sur papier, un mur, ça réduit le nombre de passages illégaux. Prenons la région de San Diego, en Californie, où un mur existe déjà. Le nombre d'immigrants illégaux arrêtés est passé de 620 000 avant la construction du mur en 1986 à 30 000 en 2016. Sauf que, pour plusieurs experts, les murs, ça ne fonctionne pas. Comme dirait une ancienne gouverneure de l'Arizona, « You show me a 50-foot wall, I'll show you a 51-foot ladder. » J'ai pas trouvé d'échelle de 51 pieds, mais j'ai trouvé ça. Une des nombreuses ruses que certains Mexicains ont déployées pour déjouer le mur. Un mur en soi n'est pas totalement efficace. Même le secrétaire à la sécurité intérieure des États-Unis, choisi par Donald Trump, le reconnaît. Pour que le mur soit efficace, on rajoute des soldats, des agents frontaliers, des drones, des caméras, des systèmes de détection du mouvement sophistiqués, et ça finit par coûter cher. Et même là, plutôt que de décourager les migrants, ça les pousse simplement vers des nouvelles routes, plus dangereuses pour leur vie. Donc, si l'efficacité des murs est remise en doute, pourquoi on en construit autant? Le mur est avant tout un outil politique. Dans les démocraties, ça va même être un outil électoral. Elle, c'est Elisabeth Vallet, une chercheuse à l'Université du Québec à Montréal. C'est aussi une référence internationale en matière de murs. Et puis, ça donne aux populations le sentiment de l'illusion, en fait, que le mur euh, va leur permettre de reprendre le contrôle de leur vie, de l'économie, de l'identité à certains égards. Avec la montée du populisme, de la droite, de la crispation identitaire, avec l'Union européenne qui s'effrite tranquillement et avec les zones de libre-échange qui sont remises en question, tout porte à croire que pour les prochaines années au moins, les murs sont là pour rester. So, I wanted to show you the whole of the clip for a few reasons. First, it's new. It's four minutes and 30 seconds. Some of the people that I watched, or that, that I actually showed this to, said it's about eight minutes, not knowing. Some said it's about three minutes. So what's going to be the right number of minutes? How are we going to treat the next subject matters? Um, Guillaume yesterday said, why is it format iPad and television and not square? for your telephone when this is social media because it's going to be impacted and it's going to change because the conversations that we're having on Snapchat, on YouTube, and all other social platforms are going to influence the way this content is going to evolve. They are going to create a community that's going to talk to each other and the content will evolve. And you saw that it's a combination of our archives. Our news anchor, Céline Galipo, the lady who actually was the more formal looking, is the person that actually delivers the news every night. She is the reference in French Canada for the news. The kids involved her and put her face in there and her clip so that there's some legitimacy and it's also a clin d'oeil to the older generation in the newsroom saying, hey, we want to work with you too. So there's a lot of stuff in that four minutes and 30 seconds. It's our first attempt to try to change the way we deliver news. Yes, 
we're not going to put this on the national uh, news program in the evening on the flapshick program but in social media right now it's trending and the next two or three subject matters they chose to look at were revenge porn were uh, transgender issues in, uh, in a region, an outmost region of uh, the province of Quebec, and how that community completely rejected that kid. So there's, there's a lot going on, and I wanted you to see our attempt at trying to change the way we deliver news. All right, last example, younger generation. Digital reporters getting closer to the community, Jose. We also go back to the north where we started our little trek around the country. And I want to show you Claudine Sanson. It's a minute, 30 seconds. It's a video journalist. She, it's a she. She's a one-person operation, a one-person band. She covers a vast territory, and here's how she does it. La caméra vidéo, je la sors quand ça mérite un traitement visuel. Les belles images du boucon qu'on aime voir. Je ne fais rien en ce moment que je faisais dans le passé. Et je ne fais rien du passé en ce moment. L'emploi a complètement changé. C'est vraiment d'aller jouer. Moi, j'ai tous les outils à ma disposition. Essayer de voir la nouvelle, comment mieux la traiter, comment est-ce qu'on peut aller rejoindre aussi les gens le plus efficacement possible, de sorte que je puisse faire dans une journée cinq ou six sujets d'une manière ou d'une autre. Donc, j'essaie le plus possible d'être un service des nouvelles pour les francophones avec ma seule et même personne. C'est la même information, c'est le traitement qui est différent, qui doit être différent parce que les gens consomment différemment. Les gens sont sur leur téléphone, même au Yukon. C'est agréable parce que je peux traiter de sujets dont je ne pouvais pas traiter auparavant. Pas assez intéressant pour les antennes traditionnelles ou pour lesquelles on n'avait tout simplement pas de place. Ah oui, non, je, je suis beaucoup plus présente que, que jamais auparavant. Stories in the regions that we could not tell before, that had no place on our standard national newscasts, are now finding a way to be told to regions, but also to the rest of Canada through these new methods. And that is why the commitment is so strong. So, in closing, I hope I showed you some of the things that we are trying to do to change. We're not doing them all perfectly, and we are learning as we go along. But every single decision, every investment, everything that comes through our hands is looked at through the filter of digital first. It's not easy, and our employees are having a tough time trying to adjust from television and radio to now digital first. Yet, we have to remember, it's not about the platform. It's not about the platform. It's about the content. It's about the compelling content that we, as public broadcasters, find, elevate, and distribute. But it's prepared differently on each of those platforms. It's about telling stories. It's not about targeting specific age groups. But understanding that the story needs to be told differently to get their attention, the attention of digital citizens, no matter how old they are. Thank you. I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Mr. Lacroix. Hands in the air. Any questions? Uh, while you're thinking of them, here is another one first. Are you there? Here. Are you there? Here. João Galvez from RTP. Uh, the, the change that you, that you talked about implies a very big change in terms of the process of the newsroom. What change uh, have you already done and what do you foresee in the future in terms of workflow and editorial governance in, in your newsroom? So the workflow changes in the newsrooms were massive. 
They started, frankly, when we, when we were hit with the cuts in 2009, and they were not identical in French and in English. The regions in French are, um, are significantly, well, I'm not going to say they're more important, but they're extremely important to French Canada because, yes, the province of Quebec has 92% of its audience across the country in that region plus Ottawa and Gatineau. So we needed to make sure that through these cuts that we were making, that we were going to be able to deliver news in the different regions in a much more efficient way. So Radio Canada actually led the way. Servers were, um, um, were updated, making sure that when, you, when Claude's in and, you, and the Yukon has a great story, she can drop ship, and then everybody can actually see that it's there and actually access it, put it into its own, or her own, or his own uh, story. So the reshaping of the workflows started in French, and we have just finished one year of work in English on the CBC side to kind of land where Radio Canada is and has been for the last two years. That was clearly driven by the view of we need to shape this around the digital shift. And that's how we started. We started in the newsroom on the floor. Where do you get the information? Where does it go? How can I make it more accessible? We trained over 8,000 people and that's still not enough. And we train the managers to train these 8,000 people. Um, we've also changed the way we, we, uh, we train. We used to fly people in. Now everything's a web seminar, which makes people think, our employees think that they're not trained anymore because they don't fly into Toronto or Montreal and spend seven days in conference rooms and then are flown back. That's difficult. Okay, my name is uh, Gerd Draxler, I'm from Austria. Uh, I don't know how you all feel. Um, I've been in journalism for the last 40 years, 20 years uh, in management, and I've never ever seen or heard a more committed CEO, manager than today. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Uh, my question is, um, how many medals did Canada make at the Rio Olympic Games? How many what? C medals. How many medals? <laughs> <laughs> well, if we talk about okay. the Olympic Games, I'll tell you about Andy Grass. Everybody <laughs> liked the Degrass Usain Bolt um, 100 meter dash. That was fun. Um, do the um, online ratings, the boost in online ratings um, uh, of uh, the medals you won, are they the driving force no. behind the online boost? So. Key performance indicators are key here, right? One of the mistakes I made was when I announced the 2014 strategy, I talked about the big picture. I talked about where we were going. I talked about what we needed to do. I talked about digital citizens. I talked about all of these spectacular concepts. But we couldn't, and I couldn't at that time, make it granular enough for our team. So for the first months, Trying to get going was difficult because nobody saw what the digital revolution at CBC Radio Canada was going to do for their own jobs. If I had to do this again, immediately in the first week, the second week, the third week, I would have started posted great stories about we did this in this particular region at that time. Look at what kind of a reach we got. We told this story differently. We challenged ourselves. We didn't do this quickly enough. So the first months were very complicated. If you are into your digital revolution, or if you're trying to make this your, your brand, speak to your employees more often and tell them all the great things that are happening. Because when they don't focus and they don't know where you're going, they're going to focus on what they're losing instead of what they're gaining and what's happening there. And that's going to drag you down constantly. Would you have um, started your strategy without having to cut down your budgets? So, sorry? Would you have started your digital strategy without having to cut your budgets? What, when, we were, when we were faced with these hundreds of millions of dollars of cuts, and literally, I mean, I took out 3,000 jobs. We took out 3,000 jobs over four years. That's about 25% of our staff. 
So when we challenged our teams, and obviously we do like you do when you have a cut, we looked at every single dollar that was not related to programming. And we cut, we actually overcut in HR. Big mistake again, because it was easy to cut an HR program because it didn't influence the content. But boy, it came back and it bit us in the behind when we needed to train and development because all the structure we had to reinvest in. So we did this. Then we looked at the newsrooms. We cut their budget, but we said, we need to tell the story differently. Hence the idea of the regional broadcast. That didn't work. We cut that again. I think that the message and my lesson learned is you know it when you need to change. And yes, your employees will look at you and say, hey, you should have done, why? I mean, you're changing your mind again? Yes, a year into the regional newscast, we shut it down and we reinvented it because we were going nowhere with it. And we could have held on to it even more to say, no, no, we're going to, no, no, no. You know it. Your gut knows it. Your numbers know it. Make the switch. Uh, another question, maybe not about uh, cuttings, but about future. How to recognize, evaluate, and implement new ideas if you say you constantly change? How so, not to be afraid of failure? Um, we're public broadcasters. We use public money. It's very difficult to fail, right? Because you're in a fishbowl, and when you fail, everybody knows. So you need to bring your team to recognize the fact that failure is OK if it allows you to go progressing. Hence, again, the comment on key performance indicators. Your indicators have to be directly linked to your strategy. So right now, our performance indicators are the surveys that we do with Canadians. I'm sure you do them, too. Do they think that our uh, regional coverage is okay? Do they find themselves in the coverage? We have a whole bunch of questions, we have, and we do them on a regular basis, twice a year, huge surveys. That's information, that's an indicator. How are we and measure ourselves with the same questions year over year? I'm sure you do that too. Then we looked at how are we gonna drive our, our, our team to meet the digital shift? So, yes, reach, yes, website visits, yes, all of these things. But now we realize that we have to change our indicators again because it's not sufficient to reach uh, 32 million people during Rio, the Rio Games or 18 million people on, a monthly, on monthly visits to CBC Radio Canada sites. We want to know what are they watching, how are they watching, how long. We want that information so that we can actually adjust our offer and our platforms to that content. And we, unlike Netflix, Unlike, unlike all of these giants that know because when you choose a movie, they know how old you are, what you did, what you had for lunch, and everything else in their, in their uh, evaluation of that click and of that movie that you actually bought or rented, we're not there yet. So we're trying to reinvest money to be better at understanding our audiences so that we can then add that to the key performance indicators and drive the strategy towards them. The indicators are, are the key, and they have to be very public, and they have to be relentlessly, relentlessly put into the quarterly uh, message uh, to your shareholders, in our case, our government, and to the public. You've got to drive those indicators. You've got to measure. You've got to measure. Hi, it's Michael McFarland from uh, the BBC. I, I just wanted to take that a little bit further. Um, uh, you're obviously in an organization which is both national and, and local and regional. How do you ensure that when you're being seduced, as we all are, by the big numbers on digital, that you're actually genuinely serving a local audience still? Because, because digital has no boundaries, and because when you do things on big stories or even interesting things, they can go viral, and, and that's where you get the numbers from. When we make regional and local programming, we know we're serving local audiences. Yes. How do you make sure you're going to do that in the future? Well, uh, does this work? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Um, how, do I, am I sure, how am I sure? The answer is, I'm not sure that the 20, 20 million people that came to visit Briar Stewart's website in Edmonton when the fires were going around were Canadians. They were from all over the world. So now you have to decide, how can you actually, and will we be able to actually find through this
connaissance fine des auditoires, this, this effort that we are making at trying to understand the clicks. Where are the clicks coming from? What's the profile? What, what um, origin? How long? That's what I'm talking about because this is absolutely key to making sure that the regional content supports the, the strategy that you have. Okay. Mr. Lacroix, thank you very much.